welcome to Splitting Hairs, episode 12, Amazing. Now, Annabelle, you have a great topic for today. Go for it. A topic, but I don't really have a title. So I guess whatever you're reading when you click on it is the title. I thought your title was great. Your body is your instrument. I want you to call it that. I insist. Your body is your instrument. And we're talking about injury today, Mm -hmm. which is something I don't think a lot of students think enough about. Yeah. Okay. It's just dealing with, um, it's naive to think that us as musicians will never come across injury. I think we should talk about prevention and what happens and, you know, what type of injuries can happen and why we don't really think about it until it actually happens. And it's happened to me and I know it's happened to you. Yep. And it's just, this is something that I think students in particular, the ones that are training, you know, and we use that word training for athletes, but we still, you know, don't really consider us musicians as athletes in that regard. So I think there's a lot to to talk about. Yeah. And I think the overarching myth that is destroyed at the end of this episode is music's not magic. It doesn't just come to you in a, Mm. in a whim or an inspiration. Yeah. You have to train for it just as an athlete does, as you've said. So that will all become really clear as we work through all these topics. Yeah. So if you think of a, a soloist in particular and you think, oh, like they didn't whip that performance out of nowhere. Yeah. There's years of training. They've looked into every single note uh, and minute detail of that music that they're playing. Then they have to put expression and emotion, which are things that are not physical, into a you know, piece of music, and then they've got the performance. It's all of these things. So you're right. It's just music doesn't happen out of nothing. Yeah, it's yeah, it's yeah. a physical activity, and you can't get away from that part. Yeah. So having said that, mm. what injury have you dealt with? Oh, I I had um, I grew up really fat. I'll, I'll say that to everybody. It's all right. I'm I'm not embarrassed anymore. <laughs> Um, if you friend me on Facebook, there's a really fat photo of when I'm 14, so you can go ahead and do that. <laughs> but because of it, you sit quite badly. You kind of um, hunch forward. Hunch. Yeah. yeah. And the violin is already quite a forward activity. So you're sort of hugging the violin. Your neck is sticking out a little bit, especially if you've already got bad posture. So I just developed lots and lots of um, neck problems and lower back problems and... Um, over the years, ever since I lost a lot of weight when I was 19, I've, I've had these recurring problems that are only just starting to get fixed now. But, you know, as we talk about all the different therapies, you know, I've basically tried everything, so we can just mm. go through them one by one. What about you? What's happened to you? Well, I had this, like, this, like, mysticism over, no, nah, I would never get injured. No, nah, I just I won't get injured. I won't ha- no, it's just it's not going to happen. And then one year... In my genius wisdom, I did like five different ensembles of playing during uni, mm. plus my solo stuff. And I'm there like in my lesson with you. I think it was <laughs> practicing fingered octaves and I, oh. for some Paganini. And I, and I just went, ow, really loudly. And you were like, oh my gosh, pain. And I was like, yeah, pain. And I basically got, you know, repetitive strain injury in yeah. my left hand. Um from just overworking these tiny, tiny muscles in mm. my fingers. And one part of it, of which we'll talk about in a moment, which was I wasn't practicing properly with thinking of bigger muscles in mind. Mm. So how I teach and how I think and how I've learned from you is, you know, you want to use our bigger muscles to support our smaller muscles to avoid injury in mm. that regards. So I was lucky. It was just sort of I'd strained muscles. It wasn't anything... Um, detrimental to further playing. But when I was, you know, going through it, I was like, oh my gosh, if anything yeah. like stops me from being able to practice, I'm not going to do well. And, you know, dramatic. Yeah. Um, but I've, luckily I just rested, started practicing properly with this in mind and I've avoided that since and I don't deal with it. And when I do overdo practice from weeks and weeks because maybe there's a concert or something I can just feel myself getting tired and that's when you just have to take your rest days as well yeah yeah rest days that's right Mm. because often uh, we don't even take a day off for months and months and months yeah there's this terrible just I know it's a joke with two set and things but it's just this 40 hours a day joke and then there's people that actually think you have to do seven hours a day 
Yeah, and, the magic numbers. Yeah. Yeah, the, and we've talked about it. This ten thousand hours. It's all. It's all rubbish. Um, so you have to practice properly, not just the numbers on the page of how many hours that you've written down that you've practiced. And you've got to look after. You've got to practice. Look after yourself and practice properly. Yeah. So what does looking after yourself look like? This is something that um, we we don't treat ourselves like athletes, which is a which is a tragedy because our muscles need to grow and build and rest. Yeah. And what goes with that, which musicians often don't think about, is food. Actually eating um, Healthy. healthily. Yeah, that's right. And and so lately there's a lot of science about inflammatory foods now and mm. that uh, they talk a lot about how that affects, well, just basically everything, cut your inflammatory foods, right? And um, so for us, if we have any inflammation, it's going to be exacerbated by um, overuse when we play the violin. So, you know, just things like drinking water, things like breathing. You know, violinists um, often don't breathe. String players often don't breathe because they don't have to because they're not wind or brass players. Mm. And um, they're not percussionists. So percussionists need their full bodies to be involved, whereas we trick ourselves into thinking that, oh, we only need to move our arms. So the rest of our body is just like, tense with anxiety yeah. and it's like a, a catch-22 the the tense body leads to performance anxiety leads to a tense body so yeah. there's all these these little puzzle pieces that fit in to a healthy attitude to playing as a string player so when i was at uni we kept getting like told every semester at the start of every semester look after yourselves not just your physical health but your mental health especially when a lot of um, you know, the semesters one and two will cross over with winter, so you don't want to get sick. But it just starts with, yeah, you know, uni is stressful. Like you can go from week one to seven and realize you've got all these assignments. Plus, as a performing um, a degree, you might, if you know, you've got your practice on top of those assignments, yeah, it, it, mm. it can just build up and it can be overwhelming. So it's mental health as well. Um, and the the catch twenty two is there as well. I mean, where where is the is is the mental health coming from bad practice without you even knowing? Like the subconscious attitude to mm. what you're doing. I mean, how many people start off by breathing really deeply ten times? I mean, mm. who does that? I mean, so, I, I don't do that. I, I do now <laughs> because you know, as we'll talk about, what I'm doing now has really helped. But breathing, guys, how about a mm. big breath? Ready. Speaking of, like, we've started recording and I had a bit of a stressful morning already, so I'm just like, I don't want to go into filming this. Just a little yeah. bit worked up, so I've already done my breathing. But as, as physical health, you know, eating healthy, that's – and eating healthy, getting good sleep, drinking water, that's not new. That is not, you know, revolutionary to be saying that now. But I think when we, we get so focused on – Oh, that recital or I want to make it as a career as this performer or whatever you lose your basics basics like getting proper sleep and if oh, you're yeah. at uni and then going on into the real world when you have late night rehearsals and late night concerts or early morning rehearsals and concerts throughout or whatever it, it can just it can just sneak up on you that you realize oh I don't have a good sleeping pattern or something that's right and it's not a myth that classical musicians can party as hard as rock and roll musicians so that's often the way we deal with our anxiety and stress and overuse is that we we go out and drink. And it's great. It's great fun, whatever. But it's so detrimental in the long term. You'll just you'll get older and if that's the only way you can calm down after a concert, that's a problem. Mm. And it's not fun anymore, you know? Okay, so as far as the training student musician goes that um, wants to learn how to practice properly with in regards to not wanting to or wanting to avoid injury how does how do we do that how do we do that i said before you know using bigger muscles to support smaller muscles you know should violinists practice sitting up up <laughs> sitting up sitting, you know, stand, lie, lie down for your practice <laughs> <laughs> stand, standing up or sitting down you know i know there's a bit of debate back and forth amongst that's not like cellists where you i wouldn't would... recommend sitting down ever you know most of your life is going to be sitting down practicing uh playing performing orchestras mm-hmm. chamber music gigs don't sit down when you practice you're crazy you actually mm-hmm. crazy not <laughs> you annabelle but anyone who sits down to practice if you think that you're uh, doing that i can imagine uh the justification well i'm performing sitting down 
So I may as well practice sitting down or I'm tired today. I'm just going to sit down and do my practice. You're cutting off the movement from the waist down. And if you cut off the movement from the waist down, uh, that's, it, it just cuts off movement in other areas like all your back muscles. You tend to breathe less because you're kind of slumped. You're bent. Um, just stand up, walk around. Walk around as you play. That's an amazing way of freeing up all the other muscles. Just take a few steps as you play a phrase. If you've got a hard shift, take a step at the same time as you shift. I'm going to credit that to Michelle Wood, cellist. I saw her give a um, tutorial. Take a step. She plays cello. No, no, no. She she lifted her leg and and stomped it down on the floor as she did the shift. So what that meant was she was showing the kids that instead of locking everything in fear and anxiety and doing a really stiff shift up the fingerboard, she lifted her leg at the same moment, which freed up that side of her body and then her arm was free to move. It was the best thing I'd ever seen in my life. I thought that is the secret to shifting. You have to make sure your other bits are flowing and loose as well. Otherwise, you're well, inhibiting that shift. I'm going to need to. I'm going to need to see this from Michelle. So. I'll oh yeah, she'll show you. <laughs> video, video, please. Yeah. Okay, well, that's but, a good idea. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So what you've said about freeing up your body, um, every every student will hear, you know, relax, 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 and you deal with tension and relax, and and you know what, tension it can come up upon you, and you don't even realize you're tense. And I've been that person. I've started yeah. playing a phrase and then I get to the end. And I'm like, why am I hurting in this area? And I don't even realize that I've gotten tense. And that was the most maddening thing to try and resolve in my playing. But do you know um, where that's coming from? You're oh, the teacher. You silence. <laughs> that is coming from reading music. So when you read music, that's what your brain's oh, doing. No, but I've had lessons with you where I was playing for memory and it was still happening. Because I practiced it in. That was the problem. Yeah, you practiced it in. Yeah. For me in particular, it was um, thinking of like totally relaxation, English, relaxation in my body from the second I start learning a bar and playing that bar for memory just straight away. And the second I start learning it, just am I free? Am I, is my oh, arm This is a new thing for you, right? You're saying that this is now, this the... is how I resolve this. Cause I would yep. go ahead and learn a whole piece and go to perform it in front of you. It's like, why am I now getting tense when yeah. I wasn't before? Yeah. And that's my little issue that I had to deal with. Yeah, that's right. But you, you said something about being free and stuff and it, and what I've learned from you, I think the biggest takeaway that I've learned from you, um, as your student is thinking of my body and stop focusing on the music on the page and what's my body doing the entire time and that that comes into recognizing where the tension is and yeah there's a few things that contribute to to uh subconscious tension one is the overall difficulty of playing the violin you know that's just a buzzing little feeling in the background that we all we all have we all have okay um then there's that we're told to use a metronome all the time, which as, you know, if you want to go and check out our metronome episode, that causes tension in the mind and the body. And then there's the specific anxiety that reading uh, brings. So if you're reading notes, um, look, I, I, I don't know this is 100% as a fact. Just but, say but, but I have heard that the brain cannot read and listen at the same time and what we do is we really quickly alternate from one to the other oh, kind of I've, like a multitasking situation I, I've, I've heard that multitasking is a myth in this regards is that a brain can only function 100 percent on one thing so yeah that's so that's what i'm saying so it yeah. feels like multitasking because you're flicking back and forward but reality is you know. but reality is if you're learning a piece of music and you haven't got much time to learn the notes you'll be You'll be buried in that music, buried in those notes, and you won't be at the same time listening to see how it sounds. So you're kind of getting into the stress of reading these abstract symbols. Whether you can read music or not, it doesn't change the fact that they're abstract symbols, that it's not a picture of a sunrise. You know, <laughs> it's little teeny weeny abstract notes, which is a totally different part of the brain than uh, looking at pictures or listening to sound, listening to music. So that's kind of interesting. And if you, you can overcome this by just play a bar at a time, read it, turn away, see if you can memorize it. Mm. That, that's a really quick way of uh, combating this phenomenon, which is I'm not even listening. I've just played half a page and I don't even remember playing it and I'm really stressed out now. So 
Yeah, turn away from the page. Yeah, not having the music in front of you, so playing for memory, whatever stage it is that you're learning, it forces you to to listen to what you're playing because you can't, your brain's not there to, like, it's not reading in front of you. Like, you just... Yeah, and it is a kind of freeing experience not to be relying on the music. I mean, it does bring other anxiety like, oh, what about a memory mistake? But if you memorize things enough and train, that's another thing. You have to mm. have to train to do that. A lot of repetition and you'll have something from memory. And who cares if you if you have a memory slip? Like, who cares? It's fine. It's like when you're going for a goal in the AFL, you miss it. It's like that... that the person who misses it, I've been watching the AFL recently and I'm not usually into the AFL, but I find it really interesting. The most interesting thing for me is they're really close to the goalposts, they miss and they just turn away and keep going with the game. You know, like how can they not get upset by that? Like it was such an easy goal. Well, how did they miss that? No, they just they just missed and they go on. And that's something that is missing for us. Every time we have a tiny little slip of a note a little fuzz, a little disconnect with the bow. We freak out and spend the rest of the performance uh, just yes. barely hanging on. That is so me. Or we cannot was, get over yeah. a tiny little slip and we get angry with ourselves. And this is completely unprofessional and self-destructive behavior. Mm. Where do you think that, like, to me, it just sounds like it comes from this notion that we must play things perfectly 100 percent all the time yes technically you, perfectly yeah and if yeah. you miss something it's just like oh why can't and then you obsess about it yeah yeah i mean look most of us are in a state of anxiety when we're performing don't let anyone tell you otherwise i mean it's to differing degrees with people and you know the big concert masters they're they they've overcome it but i'm not saying they never experience it you know I mean, I, I won't tell any particular stories of particular people, but um, the biggest secret is a lot of people are on beta blockers. Let's talk about beta blockers, actually. Yeah, I was just reading on my notes, alcohol and drugs. That's yes. the point that we were talking about. I was at uni and one girl that I was in the same year as, she would take some sort of medication. I, I don't know what it was. Um, and it would help her nerves before a performance. And I thought immediately... That doesn't seem natural. Why would you want to take something to help your nerves before you perform? So I was a, I've, I've never taken anything like that, and I'm sort of against it. But yeah, but mm. it's a, it's a. If you're against it, it's a kind of. Uh, don't take this the wrong way, but it's kind of judgy. It's like that's why it's a secret because a lot of people are judgy about it. But if you want to be a musician, and if you can't overcome your anxiety, you've got a job to do or an audition or whatever. But on the other hand, the judgy side of me says, well, it's an audition. And is it like performance enhancing drugs in sport? Like, There's a lot of sport parallels here. So yeah. should we drug test in the classical music <laughs> world? And I would say no. Because drug test. I've and taken then you, beta blockers before. No, drug test and then you may play Don Juan. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it'd probably go slower though. It'd be da, really da, boring. Da, 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 yeah. Da, 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 da. <laughs> oh my gosh. But anyway, the the point is, yeah, they are controversial actually because they like steroids in bodybuilding. Are they? Uh, I don't know. I, I I still don't know because I have taken them before and it has been good. But I've only taken them twice before, and like you, I didn't like relying on them. I mean, not mm. not like you, but like you, I have this kind of feeling about them. Like, oh, I don't know I if I an, want to rely on I just on have it. an uneasiness about the idea of taking something like that to help your performance anxiety when... Yeah, especially really hard pharmaceuticals. I mean, they're an anti-blood pressure medication or something, aren't they? I have no they're idea. They're for I heart just, or something. Yeah, yeah. It's just, to me, just there's just red flags going. This just doesn't seem right. Every performer, whether it's public speaking, athlete musician has to deal with performance anxiety uh i would say it's exceptional circumstances and where you would need to take some sort of pharmaceutical i mean it's weird you know because the the result of beta blocker is just this pure relaxation feeling and well that's that's how it felt for me and um i've i find that now when i am forced to breathe really deeply when i'm doing yoga which i've just started recently right so if you breathe really, really deeply and really consciously and like into all the muscles of your body, 
it has the same effect. So it's like, hang on a minute. <laughs> mm. Maybe I should just practice breathing all the time because that <laughs> really helps everything. We Don't get- underestimate that. Well, as students and those going into the professional world, it's like you get told to relax and look after your body and don't get injured and um, and breathe every time you play, especially when you go to start something like an excerpt in an audition or you start your, like the first note of your recital or something. You know, as a section in an orchestra, you get told to breathe together. Even string plays need to do that because then that keeps you like together and stuff. So... Yeah. More, more of this thinking about the body, you know, because, you know, <laughs> non, uh, well, instrumentalists will always sort of poke fun at singers because they they go above and beyond looking after themselves. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah. they're 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 on it because their vocal cords, their lungs, their diaphragm, that's their instrument, yeah. and they have to. If they get sick, uh, it's not the same as if a cellist gets sick in that regards you know same with wind and brass players they they do breathing exercises they breathe oh yeah blow into their instruments to warm up and stuff so the string place i think we just live in this airy fairy like nah whatever just have to sit down and whatever but i remember at uni this one girl she was a singer she had a couple weeks before her recital and she just went i think it was whether it's a day or a couple of days something and she did not talk at all she gave a note to her lecturer and said i'm just letting you know I'm not saying a single thing. She did not talk to anybody, no singing, nothing Ooh. to look after her vocal cords. That's funny. That's funny. I was laughing at this person. <laughs> <laughs> but having, you know, I'm a little bit older now, it yeah. makes sense. It's was, part of the training. Was, yeah. It's this extreme looking after herself. And it's like, I get it. I get it. We had and- the most amazing singer come in and talk about uh, how they train for different kinds of vocal roles. So according to the character of the voice so she was a mezzo and um, she explained how long it took and the kinds of exercises she had to do to get into the different kind of voice character I mean it was so meticulous it was amazing yeah listening to her it was like whoa that is professional that's not I'm gonna get on stage and the character's just gonna magically come to me it is this is what the character's voice is like and this is how I train to get exactly yeah and I when I was at uni I was talking to a singer and he was talking about just his warm-up just his warm-up he would do scales and then he would do different vowels on every single note within every single scale that he practiced to work on all the articulation which changes his mouth shape for every single Mm. uh, syllable every single note in all the keys and that was just his warm-up and I was like whoa and he was protecting his vocal cords do you realize that we are in danger right now of totally contradicting our attitude towards something do you remember that episode we did no. have you done your scales have you done your studies have you done your and we're I like wasn't, we're looking I... at singers now going oh wow aren't they amazing they do all this stuff and we just basically <laughs> slammed it in another episode hey we're only I, human no i hadn't gone there in fact i wasn't actually praising scales i was praising the fact that um the singer you were talking about and the singer I was talking about were going above and beyond to look after themselves. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, no, I still maintain scales are ridiculous in some regards and you can go and listen to that. But I'm not, not, yeah, rehashing, that's right. I'm not audience, rehashing that. Audience can be the judge. Go and <laughs> yeah. see how much we contradict ourselves. That's fine. I'm happy with that. I, I don't care. I went from thinking yoga was stupid to absolutely loving it within the last couple of weeks. So. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, we'll get into yoga in just a second. But I think it's this naive thing to think that you'll never get injured. True. So what happens when we do get injured? Let's let's talk about that. What have you done? Well, you sort of cut me off. What treatments have you done? I did physiotherapy. Mm-hmm. Um, so I injured my left hand and I have had uh, just sort of overworked my right arm a little bit in the shoulder and the elbow. Uh, And the hand therapist gave me a lot of exercises. Um, They gave me some like rubber bands and things. So uh, resistance training, but on a minute scale of my fingers, Mm. just a few exercises and then also resting. Um, And I've never had that injury again. So that really worked for me. Just taking a, like resting my body, taking a break from violin, not completely, and then doing these exercises with my fingers and my arms and my shoulder and general strength training. This mm. is what I'm talking about. Mm. And I've never had that injury problem since. 
also having said that I started practicing with this in mind about sitting up properly if I was sitting down or standing and making sure that I was using my not just my shoulders and my back muscles but also my abs and Mm. um, my biceps and things when I'm practicing so that I'm not you know straining my third and fourth finger in my left hand you know swinging that elbow around towards my body to protect that hand yeah yeah put the pain in the big muscles that's right yeah you know the most interesting person I've ever been to for treatment um he's retired now but he was a chiropractor and uh I, he he changed my life I had basically a frozen left side uh because of my injuries you know they were zigzagging all over me and he pinpointed the the originating point and he basically loosened me up and that was great and then um at one stage I went to him and I just happened to mention that I thought all my bows were really bad because they had a shake in the top of them and that's typical me blame my blame my equipment not my my body and he said oh can you just pretend to do a do a bow for me so I did a down bow and um he noticed just by looking at my arm that my my bicep was quite strong and I had zero tricep so everyone knows the bicep is the one uh, upper arm inside and tricep is upper arm outside Okay, And so, when the bicep is activated, the tricep is not as much. Yeah, so what is supposed to happen when you're doing a down bow, you're in the lower half, you do this down bow, when you get to about the middle, the tricep's supposed to take over. But if it's non-existent, the bicep keeps hanging on and that's what causes the bow shake. Guys, if you're listening, you play the violin, you have bow shakes in the upper arm, you need to build up your triceps because you you overuse the bicep all the time right and mm. so the thing about yoga lately is that all those down dogs <laughs> you can't help it <laughs> you can't help but build up those triceps and all of a sudden i feel like my muscles have a life of their own so when i'm holding up the violin my arms feel strong without force and you know what i'm like i don't like force at all oh i was gonna say forceful okay i'm wrong okay so I don't know, but yoga with its combination of breathing with the body and the movement and building up these muscles I never even knew I had has helped me so much more with violin than any other treatment. I've done Cairo, I've done physio, I've done Alexander, I've done uh, aerobics Oz style, which I absolutely love. But again, none of those things include everything. So look, I, I... I'm not, but I'm not saying I'm not saying everyone should do yoga. I'm just saying you've got to incorporate breath, body, and motion. Mm. Make sure well, your whole body is involved. We talk about okay. We talk about this thing of it's inevitable to think that we're not going to get injured, but then we try to be preventative. Well, we can be preventative by the way we look after ourselves, like we said, mental health, looking after our bodies. Um, but. You know, I've always described this very loosely as physiotherapy and the and similar things to that um, help you resolve like whatever's happened to you. But something like Alexander Technique is there designed to prevent. Now that's just my very loose definition. That's yeah, how I see it. Yeah, but you did it much more than me. I just did it once or something. So yeah. I did Alexander Technique, and if I, I I should look into it again, but it it was brilliant because it t- its whole concept is designed to sort of talk about how you use your body properly so and and training your mind to think of that well so if you think of women that sit down and they cross their legs because mm. their mind just says yeah that's what we do and that's comfortable and that's actually not good for your body mm. you know it's when you go to pick up something from the, the ground you don't just bend over you have to go down from the knees or something mm. so incorporating alexander technique um with your practice and your performing like that can be a match made in heaven Mm. but you know this comes back to just just being really aware just being really aware of what is going on in your body when you're playing and and if you're aware of that sort of stuff it it pushes out the thoughts it replaces the the negative thoughts that we've talked about in quite a few episodes you know the down talk the emotional the overly emotional useless uh, things you say to yourself as you're going oh you know I made a mistake I don't sound good I've you know all that negative stuff if you're instead thinking um how's my right arm what's my elbow doing you know like if you're just replacing that down talk with with little catchphrases like I've got so many catchphrases for my students just to to remind them 
care to share? Um, <clears throat> yeah. Okay. If you can't relax in time, take the time to relax. So that's like against the metronome. Hmm. It's like don't try and play metronomic, right? But that's not about the body. Um, yeah, I've got my list here. Jiggle or wiggle or shake it. So that's like do a little butt shake and then you'll just kind of loosen everything up. And in some exercise routines or even in yoga, you've been holding a posture for quite a long time. And even if you're breathing through it, it can be quite strenuous. So once you let go of that posture, you can shake, just shake it out. It's a bit Tai Chi as well, just like getting the energy moving, moving through. Um, relax back, relax butt, smile. Oh, smile's a good one. As soon as you smile, it changes the whole dynamic of your body. It's really interesting. Uh, Wonder and Woman, I, Captain Marvel, standing up straight, chest out. Um, that's a proven thing, by the way. It is a proven thing. The hormones that get released are... And same with smiling. Yeah, smiling. Yeah. Well, while you discovered yoga and strength training that away, one of the things that I know you also discovered was flotation therapy. Oh, yes. And that this was my saving grace when it came to every single muscle in my body being relaxed focusing on my breathing getting a great night's sleep that night and then having the best practice the day after and I tell them when I go and do them like this helps me as a musician as an instrumentalist um oh just yeah I don't even have the words everyone should just go and try oh it's so weird um yeah it's it's great and I used to do it regularly until stage four restrictions same yeah and um I've got this fantastic lady. She's called Michelle Whitewood, and I'm going to give her thing so a little So Michelle plug. Wood got some got a mention, and Michelle Whitewood yep. got a mention. Are these the same? These are not the same people. These are not the same people. <laughs> M- Michelle Whitewood has a place in Melbourne called Water Temple Flotation Therapy. So look that up and go and give it a try. It's the weirdest thing ever. You're lying in, in a tank. The lid comes down. You turn the lights off you're in warm water which is the same temperature as your body your butt naked it's heavily it's it's so salty i've got in my eyes oh Oh, it's no it's so salty that it dries to crystal so you've got to have a shower beforehand and a shower afterwards um but once you're in there let's talk about what happens it totally resets your brain it totally resets your central nervous system so if you find that you're going through life angry upset sensitive like overly sensitive um crying at the drop of a hat this is your this is you running off adrenaline this is my my therapy session right now i need i need these (laughs) i need these open again i need to go for float (laughs) yeah absolutely and because lockdown's been really really psychologically hard for for everyone and everyone and um that's why yoga saved me because it has a really similar impact um as flotation except with flotation you're completely physically relaxed And you go into this meditative state of deep, deep relaxation. And, um, and as you say, it, it filters into every other part of your life because when are you that relaxed? Because often you're not relaxed like that when you're sleeping, you might be dreaming, you might be having a nightmare, or you might have a really light interrupted sleep because you're so full of anxiety. Mm. So, um, flotation, highly recommend that. I recommend doing the evening ones and then you go home and you have the best sleep ever you go straight to bed afterwards oh i've never done that i've always ha- done I've it in the day i know i know so do it yeah because then just you will have the deepest sleep ever and it's the greatest yeah okay so right. how come i've just got one more thing to say if you were trying to wrap this up yeah i was <laughs> i've but just go got on. one more thing to talk about why is it that from what i can see classical musicians at least in this country are so disconnected from their body actually as a as a as an attitude as a lifestyle why why are people stiff why are people so anxious that they don't even want to move sway are they afraid they're going to get teased or mm. you know because i i grew up actually i grew up and the people who moved the most were always made fun of where did that come where does that even come from it's yeah i mean i i have the same thing like we joke about people swaying we joke about the fact that as soon as <laughs> as soon as um you can see as soon as the music turns it's something that your body can either sway to or bop to you see all the string players doing that. It's really funny <laughs> like this the second it happens i wish i had a musical example of that oh my gosh it was so good but you've seen it in people um 
Because it, it looks funny and it's weird. But, but what, what makes us think it's weird when we'll, we'll go and look at Tycho's drumming and, and just get completely blissed out going, these guys are amazing. That's music. That's physical. Yeah, it's drumming. It might stem back to if we think of refined classical musicians and they're in their all blacks and they're in a symphony orchestra and they're playing, I don't know, Mahler or Beethoven or something and it's just like you must just pretentious, I don't know. And it's com- intellectual music and it's yeah, for the and upper classes yeah, and it's, maybe, it's maybe less it's... folky, it's kind of less dirty or less gypsy or less, it's but this then, kind of refined music. But then if you look at soloists, violin soloists, like I know people that, so not necessarily, um, I've seen performers play where they could be like Heifetz who didn't move at all and it's yeah. hard hard to watch. Mm. Um, I've seen people that move too much and it's hard to watch. So I I'm I go both ways in that regard. Yeah. I'm like, I, you know, that's when I have to just like not look at people and just listen to their sound. But your what your body does will affect your sound. Absolutely. A hundred percent. And I remember in one of my lessons I was – I couldn't tell at the time, but you just said, stop leaning on your left leg, mm. lean on your right leg a little mm. bit. And the sound was tenfold. Yeah. Um, if you're moving, so, cause some teachers are like, no, don't move at all. Only move what you need to, like in your arms. Oh, and God. then some people can be like, it's too much moving. So you have to find that balance, but you have to, as you say, constantly be moving. If, I, I seriously want to see this video of Michelle kicking the floor or something. <laughs> yeah, I'll get um, her to make it. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Um, like you have to be, you know, you're constantly breathing. You've got to be moving your arms. You've got to be looking like it's just there can't be no movement, but they can't be overdoing it. And if, if we we're a musician, it's got to come back to what's it sound like. And, and how think- is it connected to the music? Actually, it, it's not just moving for its own sake. Um, it's not just moving because, oh, great. Now splitting hairs girls have told us to move. Now I've got to move. It's not that. It's that how are we going to connect everything? Breath to body to music to memory, to performance, how are we going to do that? And how are we going to get there without hurting ourselves? You know, like we've got to find a way to make it seem really natural because we're, we're, we're working towards being professional or at least having a professional attitude to it, taking out all that negative emotion and moving can actually help with that re- restoration of, hey, this is really fun instead of mm. this is really stressing me out. Yes, but I think what can happen in students is it, I've seen it in teaching beginners. You teach them that we must stand like this, hold a violin like this, but naturally we develop bad habits yeah. um, and bad technique if that's not corrected as you're learning. Yeah. So I think the more you get on, like you might find that oh, moving too much or not moving enough uh, it just becomes a bad habit for you and you have to just keep retraining yourself. Like it's constantly a learning thing as well. And to be constantly conscious about it. Like conscious, yeah, that's the word. Yeah, yeah, you that's can't, right. You can't let it slip that it's becomes so second nature to you. Like there is some parts of picking up a violin after decades of playing and going, I don't have to think about is my bow hold correct because it just falls naturally once you've done it for mm. years and years. But you have to always think about, oh, okay, am I tensing in that hand or something? Yeah. What's what's my other arm doing? How am I standing? Are my shoulders hunching in or are they broad shoulders or something? Yes, because so. there's such instinctive things to happen, especially when you're tired. All of these things will start to, mm. to happen. Yeah. Mm. Great. So wrapping up, mm-hmm. you'll probably get injured. Try not to eat healthy. <laughs> <laughs> Is that it? <laughs> Maybe. You say stuff. Okay. All right. So... <clears throat> Okay, your body is your instrument. I think you should call it that, Annabelle. I really do. Yeah, okay, done. All right, we're done. Bye. Thanks for listening to this episode of Splitting Hairs. Hope you enjoyed it. Yeah, and if you're listening on one of the audio-only platforms, jump over to YouTube where you can see more content and what we look like. (laughs) I'm the young one. Like, share, and subscribe, and we have all the social medias like normal people, so go and follow us there as well. Awesome. Okay, bye. What's up? Bye.